Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. Today we're finishing up our two-part series entitled Young Kapoor Part 1 and Part 2. This message today is entitled The Fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. Last week in Part 1, we talked about the institution of the Day of Atonement as a feast. We went through Leviticus chapter 16, verse by verse, starting at verse 1 and left off at verse 14. What I really want to bring out, though, in this message is how the feast is fulfilled by Jesus in regards to our salvation and how it will be fulfilled in the future prophetically. Just a quick refresher from last week. The first thing that the high priest did was to bathe his body with water. And then he put on the holy linen coat with the linen undergarments. The linen sash was tied around his waist and the linen turban was on his head. We went into detail on the significance of these things. So if you haven't seen part one, I would suggest that you go back and watch part one. I suggest that you do it before you watch this one. But either way, moving on. Then the high priest was to sacrifice the bull as a sin offering to make atonement for himself and for his house. In other words, he was to make atonement for himself and his family. He was to take a censer full of coals from the altar, along with two hands of sweet incense, which represents the prayers of God's people. We find that in Psalms 141 verse 2, Luke chapter 1 verse 10. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. Then there were two goats that the high priests were to select. He would cast lots over them. One lot would fall to one goat, and that goat would be presented to the Lord, which would be used as a sin offering. And the other lot that fell to the other goat was used as a scapegoat. That goat would be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. This is the section that I want to concentrate on in this message. This section with the two goats. I want to show how the function of those two goats were fulfilled by Jesus. So, with that said, let us get right into this message. So please turn with me to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20 through 28. It says, And when he has made an end of a tuning for the holy place and the tent of Medan and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote place, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of Medan and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. Afterward he may come into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burnt up with fire. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. The high priest was to lay both of his hands on the scapegoat's head. Every other time we read in scripture about a sacrifice, the instruction is to lay a hand, one hand on the head of the sacrifice. 
For instance, Leviticus chapter 1 verse 4, He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. It shall be accepted from him to make atonement for him. Leviticus chapter 3 verse 2, And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's son, the priest, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. But this time, during the days of Yom Kippur, during the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, both hands was to be used. Both hands was to be laid on the head of that goat. Every other time as we saw, it was either for the individual or for him and his family or for Israel. But this time, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it was both hands signifying that this sacrifice was both for Jews and for the Gentiles. Nobody was excluded. The atonement work by Jesus is for the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The only thing, or the other thing, that I want to bring out is that every other time confession was made over the sacrificial offering. Whereas in this ceremony, confession was made over the goat not offered as a sacrifice, but was set free, so to speak. Think about that for just a moment. Think about that. Once the high priest had transferred the sins of the nation on the scapegoat, it was sent away into the wilderness to Azazel by a man previously designated to do that job. That is all well and interesting, Brother Kenny. But what does that have to do with Jesus? Well, that's a reasonable question. Remember that Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus also told John the Baptist at his baptism, Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitted for us to fulfill all righteousness. The reason why it was so important for Jesus to be baptized by John the Baptist was because he, Jesus, had to fulfill every aspect of the law. Therefore, just as just like the scapegoat had to receive all the sins of Israel and to have those sins transferred onto its head, in the same way it was necessary for Jesus to have every sin of every man, every woman, every child that will ever live and who has ever lived to be laid upon him in order to fulfill the requirements of the law. I want us to look at what the scripture says about it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. This is a prophecy made about the promised Messiah about 700 years before Jesus was even born. Did you notice what it said? And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is a picture of the scapegoat. In the same way that the sins of Israel was transferred to the scapegoat, the Father, the, our Heavenly Father, laid on Jesus, His Son, the sins and iniquities of the whole world. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, when the sin and iniquities of the whole world were placed on Jesus, he became that scapegoat. Now to completely fulfill every iota of the law, the scapegoat has to be sent away into the wilderness 
to Azazel. Azazel is a place. It is not a goat demon. So where is that place then? In short, it is hell. Because Jesus has to take the sin and iniquities away from the camp and away from the people. It just can't be left there. Sin is a vile, vile thing. So it has to be taken out of the camp and away from everything. Remember what the scripture says in Romans chapter 6 verse 23? It says, for the wages of sin is death. This is not talking about a normal physical death, but it's talking about the second death. Otherwise, there would be no need for a second death that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. If the normal physical death satisfied that requirement. Look, let us read those two verses just for clarity's sake. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, if physical death was the penalty for sin, and Jesus paid that penalty by dying on the cross only, we would not have to physically die ourselves. Otherwise, that is called double jeopardy. Neither would those who die without Jesus be sent to hell because the wages of sin would be satisfied by the physical death. But since the wages of death is not normal physical death, the payment is left outstanding and has to be paid by someone, but by whom? It's paid by Jesus, our only propitiation for sin. Remember what the law said, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgression, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. It had to be a man who is in readiness, a specially prepared man. In other words, a man who was ceremonially clean. But this time, it was not just ceremonially clean. It had to be a sinless, perfect man who was ceremonially clean. A man who is in readiness that can only be fulfilled by Jesus. Are you beginning to see how every aspect of the law had to be fulfilled? Jesus is both those goats. He had to be the sacrifice and he had to also carry the sins and the iniquities to Azazel, the place void of God's presence, which is the penalty of the second death. Now, we can benefit from what Jesus did for us because the wages of sin has been paid. That's why Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God, of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. But someone might say, oh, but Brother Kenny, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Well, that's a good point. But if you notice, he said, I thirst, and they gave him sour wine to drink. Wine represents the covenant. What he was speaking of was the old covenant is now completed. It is finished. The old is gone and the new has come. 
We have a video on our website explaining that in more detail. The link is posted below. I encourage you to check that link out. But let us look at what the book of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Then we're going to skip down to verse 13. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy place. In the true tent, the Lord set up, not man. Then skip down to verse 13. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. What is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. See, Jesus' death and resurrection ushered in a new covenant. And now the old covenant is obsolete and it is passed away. We are under the new covenant of Jesus' blood because of his great mercy, because of his great love for us. Everything was done physically, but the spiritual and prophetic were still to come according to the Lord's muadim, meaning appointed times. Therefore, it was necessary for Jesus, our scapegoat, to carry the sin and the iniquities of the world into the wilderness to Azazel. Azazel represents the place where the presence of God is not. There's no presence of God in Azazel. But someone will say, aha, now we got you, Brother Kenny. Because David says that even in hell, God's presence is there. Okay, well, let us explore that avenue then. Psalms 139, verse 8. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. See, the King James Version has that word translated hell, but the more accurate translation is the word Sheol. The Hebrew word Sheol means the place where the dead goes until the judgment. After the judgment, even Sheol is cast into the lake of fire, which is true hell. Revelation 20. Verse 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, death and Hades, which is the Greek word Sheol, they both will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is hell. This is the second death, the penalty or the wages of sin. See, the presence of God is in Sheol. It is in Hades, but not in hell, not in the lake of fire. And that's why it is the second death because it is Azazel away from the presence of God. Therefore, it was necessary also for Jesus to complete this and carry away our sins. That is the reason why Jesus was praying so fervently the night he was betrayed, because he knew the scriptures, he understood the Moedim, he knew the appointed times, he understood what was awaiting him. Think about this for a moment. Jesus was begging his father, please, please, if there is another way, let us do it that way. If only this cup could pass from me, please, if there's another way. He was so passionate that even his sweat became drops of blood. Now, after all of that, 
Jesus turns around and he commands us to not shrink back, even from death, even from torture. And in a time of that dreadful things that could happen to us, being burned alive, being drunk, no matter what it is, we're not to shrink back from it. Or we're not worthy of him. Now, for him to command us to do that, and he himself didn't want to do it, do that sound fair to you? No, it doesn't. And it's because, because it was not because of the beating. It was not because of the death that he suffered on the cross. It was none of those things that Jesus was afraid, but because of the awful, terrible, godless punishment of hell where he had to pay the wages of sin that terrified him. It's so terrified, terrifying a place that Jesus himself chose to go there rather than send us there. He made a way for us to get out by him paying the full penalty for sin, being the all-sufficient sacrifice for sin, for iniquities, so that we do not have to go there. The only people who go there are those who choose to go there. Those who say, we do not need you, Jesus. We can do it ourselves. And clearly, they cannot because they wind up in hell in that lake of fire for all eternity. I want to tell you a story about the Day of Atonement that I came across. It is a story in the Midrash, which is the Jewish equivalent to our commentaries. But it's actually really much more than that. But just to simplify it for definition's sake or definition purposes, we're going to call it a Jewish commentary. Now, I want you to please understand that this Midrash Midrash is written by Jewish rabbis who do not believe that their Messiah has come. They reject Jesus as their promised Messiah and they teach others to do the same. Anyway, there's a narrative in the Midrash that explains that on the day of atonement, the high priest would nail a piece of scarlet wool to the door of the temple before all the ceremony ceremonial activities started. I want to read that quote. Here's the narrative. Quote, And it is taught in the Baratum, During the 40 years before the second temple was destroyed, the strip of crimson wool would not turn white. Rather, it would turn a deeper shade of red. And we learn in the Mishnah, when the temple was destroyed, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zaki instituted his ordinances. When was the second temple destroyed? It was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Now let us do a little bit of math. 70 AD minus 40 years gives us an approximate time of 30 AD. What took place with any type of significance in 30 AD? It was the crucifixion, the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. His all-sufficient sacrifice took place around that same exact time. So all the time prior to 30 AD, according to this story, at the end of the ceremony of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that scarlet wool would turn white, signifying God's acceptance of the offering. After 30 AD, however, it quit turning white. And as a matter of fact, it turned a deeper red, according to that writing that we just read. Why did the crimson thread not turn white anymore? 40 years, beginning 40 years before the destruction of the temple. I'll tell you why. Because the animal sacrifice was no longer acceptable to God because Jesus is the promised Messiah whose blood is sufficient 
for all of us to be saved. There's no other name given unto heaven by which a man shall be saved except the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. Matter of fact, look at this, Psalm 40, verse 6. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have given me an ear. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Then David wrote this in Psalm 51, verse 16. You will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Understand, animal sacrifice was never the end result, but a pure sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, an unblemished sacrifice. That was the only thing that would be acceptable to our Father God for sin. And that could only be supplied by Jesus, the sinless Son of God. So we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the two goats. What am I saying? I am saying, in regards to salvation, the feast of Yom Kippur has been fulfilled. Are you ready for the day when Jesus comes back and reign and rule all the nations from Jerusalem? That day is closer now than when we first began. If you look around at all that is going on in the world, the talk of 15-minute cities, digital government control currencies, AIs and holograms, wars and rumors of wars, chaos and violence, government orchestrated food shortages, and the likes. Perilous times are here. Now that we see all these things happening, the Bible says, look up. Your redemption is close at hand. Even knocking at the door. Are you ready? If you would like to be ready, because you're not ready right now, but you want to be ready, all you got to do is ask Jesus into your heart before it's too late. Once he comes back, it's all over. The door's got to be closed and no one will be let in. So if you want to be sure of eternal life with Jesus, all you got to do is to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. I want to be in eternity with you. Oh Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Thank you for the opportunity that you offer for salvation, for eternal life. I accept it now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. It's so, so important that you get a Bible, that you read your Bible for yourself. Do not rely on what a preacher says, what an evangelist says, what your friend says, what, what you hear on the internet. Read the Bible for yourself. Make sure that what they're saying is correct. To join a Bible-believing church. One of those churches that, not a wayward church that thinks that anything goes, that love is love. And join a thus saith the Lord who has a standard. What is right and what is wrong. Join that church. Be disciple in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, enter in to the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you so much. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.